Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be doing a market update, uh, especially with the S&P 500. I'm recording this before the New York session opens on December 7th. So, uh, you know, let's begin here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to play a little bit of what's going on on, on CNC. NBC at this moment. Again, and wherever they can trade down on price, they're trying to do so. And it's really why, if you look at uh, what we did in our holiday season, you know, it's always important to save customers money, particularly during the holidays and especially in this type of economy. And so we, you know, in our prime big deals day, which was our, our exclusive event for prime members to kick off the holidays, we had tens of millions of deals and it was by far the best kickoff event that we ever did. Jim, you know, uh, that's interesting. And especially coming on the back of hearing from Doug McMillan yesterday as well, the other major retailer in our country, uh, in, in terms of the consumer, what else stood out to you? Well, look, I think that the consumer, uh, I, I was surprised when the consumer starts buying. I thought they would, for the holiday season, pay up a little more. But, you know, Andy Jassy's talking about some of these uh, Chinese sites, the Shein, that that's doing incredibly well. The people are looking for bargains, but it's the lower end. I'm wondering if the lower end isn't struggling. You put that together with what McDonald's said yesterday, lower end having trouble. There is just this cohort data that has been left behind. And it's important that we remember that this is the group that's been left behind by inflation. So I know a lot of people feel, when, certainly in the bond business, that inflation is under control. That is not what I felt from, uh, from Andy Chess. Yeah, I feel like we have been hearing, certainly anecdotally, that there has been weakness, particularly at the, at the lower end, so to speak. Um, uh, of income, Jim. You know, I, I wonder right. though, does that really translate into a significant diminution in overall demand? No, I don't think so. I just think that if you're in the high end and you're trying to sell something online uh, for the holidays, I think you're going to struggle. It, it's not where the money is. And by the way, these Chinese sites, you, you, there's no, they're partners with Andy Jassy. But if you go to them, you'll see that the average price for what people are buying is 12 bucks. It, it's very hard to make money on a 12 bucks item if you're uh, Amazon because it costs $6 per package to sell. But I, to, to bring it to you, but David, I think Amazon's doing fabulously because they can pivot. There's, they don't have inventory, but if I were a brick and mortar store and I listened to that, no confidence. I have no confidence I'd be able to sell my high-end stuff. Yeah, and it's an interesting point on the likes of Shein, which, of course, we've reported on endlessly over these last few months, which will be coming public next year, and Timu, which uh, I've been talking about a lot lately, in part because of the very strong numbers. I think it was still last week that we got from Pinto to a PDD, sort of that new business model they have in terms of how they access consumers, how they respond so quickly to trends, really just based on the desires of the consumer themselves. But, Jim... Amazon's a lot more than uh, than about selling stuff to people. It's also, as we say endlessly, about AWS. In fact, really, so much of the profits and growth of the company has been from that incredibly important engine. Jassy discussed that with you, of course, talking about, hey, it's a $92, $2 billion business, annual revenue run rate business right now. You know, what did you pick up from him uh, in terms of beyond that? We can take a listen to some of the sound that he, that, that uh, or his, his thoughts that he shared about AWS. I continue to be very bullish about AWS come 2024 and beyond. I think that, um, you know, the business today is a $92 billion annual re you know, revenue run rate business. 90% of the global IT spend is still on premises. If you believe that that's going to flip in the next 10 to 20 years, which I do, if we continue to have the best functionality by a large bit than we did, like we do, if you, if you continue to have the largest partner ecosystem, which we do, with the strongest operational performance and security as we do, and the customer orientation we do, I think we have a lot of growth in front of us. You agree? Yes. The contrast between retail, where there are obviously some concerns, and AWS, Amazon Web Services, is so stark. And, you know, Andy Jesse comes from that. David, AWS is doing far better than people realize. I mean, one of the takeaways I have is that if you're along Amazon, as my chat trust is, You've got to feel so confident because the division that people are really worried about, AWS, because that's been going down in terms of this rate of growth. That's what it, it's, it's switched direction. It's totally inflected. A lot of it, by the way, is an actual AI. And a lot of it is just the, the huge amount of, of 
of hyperscale compute that is necessary if you're going to be able to do these large language uh, models. Th this thing is a juggernaut team. It is completely different from retail. And I, I think that, that Andy, I think we'll be able to talk to Google, uh, Microsoft, holy cow. These guys are making money right now on all the stuff we talk about. And, and you'll see that also with AMD, with what Lisa Sue said. It's far ahead of plan. And that is what Wall Street doesn't understand. Wall Street's too jaded. This is where the money is. All right. Um, Jim, we're going to be getting a lot more, obviously, from your interview with Jassy. As you mentioned, we also do uh, have some comments from Lisa Sue as well, to our own Christina Parts and uh, I do go want to uh, get some, to some breaking news from the White House on health care. And for that, we'll go to Bertha Cooks with the latest Bertha. Thanks, David. The Biden administration doubling down on trying to lower drug prices and looking to step up antitrust scrutiny in healthcare. The administration is now proposing to let HHS use what's called margin rights on drug patents that were developed with taxpayer funding. And they are going to allow the HHS to use high prices as one of the reasons they can march in using a provision of the 1980 Bayh-Dole Act which is a bipartisan law which paved the way for universities to patent and commercialize discoveries made with federal funding, ranging from Google to AIDS and cancer therapies. Now, it's never been applied on the issue of price. Just last March, the National Institutes of Health denied a petition from cancer groups to use the margin provision on extending. That's a prostate cancer treatment that lists for more than $160,000 to allow drug makers to produce it, other drug makers to produce it, that led to this review and the new proposal. But beyond margin for drugs, the administration is also going to launch a joint DOJ, FTC, HHS task force to work more closely on antitrust issues and looking at consolidation in other areas like private equity and hospitals buying up physician groups. They're going to require greater transparency on ownership of healthcare entities, including more oversight of private Medicare Advantage insurance plans. Now, Joe Allen, who's a former Senate staffer for Senator Birch Bayh, who helped write up this bill, he has concerns. He told me, you know, the key for March in was whether this would be available for people to use and then to use some criteria to see if it's being made available. But just arguing that you don't like the price is not the way the statute works, he told me. David. Bertha, thank you, Bertha Coombs. Uh, Jim, obviously, the drug makers say, listen, we spent many years and take a great deal of risk investing in these therapies that when they do work, we should obviously be able to participate in having significant uh, opportunity to profit from it over some period of time before they go off. Well, what are your thoughts about this? I know you've also talked about the provisions in the IRA for some time that are going to start to take effect, uh, I believe, even starting next year as well in terms of bringing certain prices down on drugs. <sighs> David, this is flattery testing. I mean, uh, these major drug companies, which had formerly had a pretty big role uh, in our country's R&D, where we are a national leader, are so under assault. And uh, it's so visible. It, David, it's so visible that it's political. And I say that because antitrust, I mean, tell me which ones of these are not competing for anything. Uh, the idea that, they're, that these guys are paying, but you, that you have to pay them too much, if you're already negotiating, Medicare's negotiating with these companies for the first time ever, David, and it's not enough. I, this administration is running roughshod over these companies. I'd be curious to see what the reaction is in the market today, but you're listening. Yeah, it is a, certainly a key issue. Um, and as I said, Jim, that the, the pharmaceutical companies will continue to argue. I mean, we, we have to be able, we're not going to make the investment if we can't get the return, right? Simple as that. Yeah. I, look, that's always been the argument. Then they say they're going overseas. Whatever. All I can say is, is that it doesn't seem to matter what the drug companies do. It's You can visibly assault them, and people will say, yes, that's it. Inflation. They understand in the White House. All right. <clears throat> that was CNBC. I'm going to go uh, to Bloomberg here and see what they're saying. There's some economic data that's coming in. Let's see. Yes, uh, you know, the rhetoric over the, over the late summer was the sustainability or the tenability of the deficits that were right in this country. Greater 
to every portfolio manager's mind. And that there needs to be some more term premium in the market because of this increased supply. So it's a technical issue, but you have to, you have to find demand and demand comes when you essentially have the right price. And so uh, what I would see is that we expect to see if there's an economic downturn or rally. Um, but as I say, you don't really want to own 30 year bonds for 30 years. We want to rent them. We want to rent them for a rally. Uh, I do think they, they do have a meaningful move, but I think the magnitude of that is less than what we've seen in previous cycles because now we're back to having a world that we've seen inflation. We know that the fiscal response could be massive. And I think that will be on traders' minds as well. So I do think you still get a rally. I just think that it's not as meaningful as it would be in past cycles. Because again, we've seen inflation. We need to price inflation back in the market. And we see that if there is a big dose of fiscal, uh, which we've had a constant fiscal dose really for the last decade. Um, but it, it, if they do it in the magnitude, if you just did half of what we did during the pandemic, uh, I can see you getting a sharp reversal in rates, and it's probably at the pressure valve there would be the dollar. And so the way I would try to play that too, that is you want to own the rates um, going into it, you want to be long the dollar, but effectively, if you start to see that fiscal response mechanism, ultimately that's your cue that it's time to really start looking at the international markets and get out of some of the dollar and probably get out of some of those back-end rates positions. We've moved our key rates down a little bit with this rally, uh, the stuff we own in the back end. Um, you know, we think a little bit of this went a little far, but again, we still own duration. We just moved it in the curve a little bit more to like the 10 year and 20 year parts of the curve. Interesting. Save that dollar call because Matt Holmback, I know, has thoughts. We'll get to them in just a moment. Matt Holmback, Jeff Sherman. Look at the market right now. Equity futures positive by about 0.3%. On the S&P. Let's get some movers. Yes, Abby. Helping that positive tilt, John. Let's start off with the shares of JetBlue. They are up more than 8%, or at least the last time that I saw them. This after JetBlue, the airline company, tweaked its fourth quarter guidance uh, to a narrower, narrower loss in both the top and bottom line. They're talking about healthy travel demand, and that's why they're able to boost that fourth quarter revenue guidance. AMD up nearly 3%. They unveiled their AI chip yesterday at their big event, a competitor to NVIDIA. And I think also investors really liking the fact that CEO Lisa Su said that the AI chip market could be as large as $400 billion over the next four years. To the downside, though, Nikola down 23%, plunging on its plan to raise capital via both uh, stock and converts. Uh, the former leads to dilution clearly. The latter could. The stock into today down 55%. There's a 20% short interest. Tough year for Nikola, John. Abby, thank you. Great interview with Lisa Su and Ed Ludlow. We'll bring you some of that. We'll catch up with Ed in about 15 minutes' time. Look out for that. Coming up next on this program, Paley under fire in Alabama. You have other candidates up here like Nikki Haley. She caves anytime the left comes after her, anytime the media comes after her. She should come nowhere near the levers of power, let alone the White House. GOP candidates targeting Nikki Haley as she continues rising in the polls. That kind of I never really liked Nikki, Nikki Haley. I, you know, she just reminds me of just a typical policy, you know, um, UN ambassador type. I, I don't like those, those, even though she was a governor. I believe she was a governor. All right. All right. What I want to do is go in a little bit of detail on the S&P 500. For the ones that have been paying attention to me for a year, I've been doing this for a year, uh, showing this dynamic that's been going on. All right. So we're doing a simulcast between YouTube recording and uh, space spaces on X. All right. So I've been telling you about these Fib sequences, the Fibonacci sequences. Um, and these these sequences overlap. All right. There's three of them. All right. And one Fib sequence is a short term Fib. Fib sequence, another one's a medium term, and then a longer term, and they overlap. When they overlap, that means that there are strong buy and strong uh, sell signals or support and resistance levels. All right. So in the short frequency Fib sequence, that started the bull rally. All right. Um, all the way into what we're having today. Now that bull rally started around mid, around October or so. 
of last of uh, of last year. Okay, and there is another fib sequence that's the the bottom of the COVID crisis all the way to the very top of the S&P 500, the, the record, the record level. And then there's another FIB sequence where it goes to, make sure I got my data right here, um, goes all the way to the 20, 2016 in January, there was a correction that was going on in the market. So it bottomed out all the way up to the very top of the S&P 500. So you have this 2016 FIB sequence, this 2020 FIB sequence, and then this new bull market FIB sequence, all right? Well, there are support levels and resistance levels that are really important that are all overlapping. And I was saying that the 38, the 38 percent retracement and the 50 percent retracements were really important. The 23 percent retracements were really important. So a very strong support level in this bull market. Now you got to remember, I've been saying this for a year, and it's all playing out. And if you don't believe me, just go back to the old recordings. But there's a 50 percent retracement. On the on the short frequency fib sequence and an overlap with the twenty three percent retracement on the mid frequency fib sequence and a twenty three percent retracement on the long frequency or the you know the uh, the, um, the 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 longer duration fib sequence. All right. Um, okay. So with that in mind you have this support level at at around 410 412 on spy spy is the etf for the s p 500 and that is exactly what played out it bounced off it bounced off of the 23 percent retracement it was about the four the 40, 409 and then it started marching up so i was predicting that there was this strong support level at around 410, 409, somewhere in there because of this overlap between the 50% retracement on, on uh, the shorter duration FIB sequence compared to the long duration FIB sequence, okay? Now, this March, this this march up of, of the of the price started at approximately October 26th. That's when it bottomed out and bounced right off of the 23% retracement on the, the 2016 FIB sequence. All right. Now it blew past the short term FIB sequence, past the 38% retracement and blew past the 23% retracement. Now, I said in a video that this year that we're going to be seeing it surpass the 460 on the S&P 500. I also said, now this was before, before when I did my last recording on, on, this, on this, it was before October 7th and the crisis that was happening in Israel. So there's been a little bit of a, a perturbation on the, on the market because of the crisis in Israel, but it seems to be playing out. Now we're now in December 7th, you have money managers that are probably gonna try to um, you know, book uh, a decent return for their investors. And then perhaps a new correction will take place. Now, what I need to, to tell the audience, what I need to tell the audience here is, is that there was a channel that was developing going all the way back to September of last year. 
uh, a bottom channel and an upper channel. So this the market was channeling, and that channel broke on the, on around the crisis that took place. It was touching the channel right before October 7th. But with October 7th, it did break it. And then it mean reverted back into the channel and then broke it and broke again. It broke again at around uh, October 18th and went below the channel. But now with this bounce off of the 23% retracement on the FIB sequence for the 2016 FIB sequence, it started marching up. There's a, there's a there's kind of this mini rally that's that's taking place, and it's been pretty aggressive. This gives me, and it's back in the channel again. So it did break around when Israel started having their problems, and at that time we were also having issues with Congress uh, finding a speaker. So that was that, that there was two things that were going on there at the same time. It's back into the channel and it's pretty aggressive. There's not too many red candles. It's pretty much all green. So uh, in the short term, we're probably going to see it surpass the 460 for the S&P 500, the, the first five for the ETF, um, non-leveraged. And it's very possible. It's possible. I'm not saying it's a guarantee. But it's very possible that we retest the 479, 480 mark on the S&P 500. So that's the the kind of the, the, the background. Now, what are the upsides and what's the downsides? Upside is, is that it's, it may trade in between 460 to 480 um, and you know bounce around a little bit. I don't think it'll surpass the 480 mark by the end of the year. Uh, going into next year, depending on how holiday sales are, depends on you know what kind of uh, stability the market will be in in, in, in January. Um, right now, holiday sales for at least the low end, which is kind of surprising, seem to be decent. High end products don't seem to be doing so well at this moment in time, but you know the data is still relatively. Um, um, nascent so we you know we can kind of we need a little bit more time to, to understand what's going on with the holiday season but it's pretty aggressive in the channel it's a it was an aggressive move that is that has happened once it bounced off of that fifth, fifth sequence support level which i said it would if it was going to touch it it was going it, that was a pretty pretty strong support level so all right so it, it did play out so I think that we're going to see the 460 mark break pretty pretty soon here. Um, and we might see it touch the 480 mark for the SPY, for the S&P 500 ETF. Now, what's the support levels if something happens? You know, something crazy happens in the Middle East or whatever. You know, things really get worrisome with the economic data that's coming in from the United States. Uh, we we have to go back to where are the support levels, and that those support levels are either the the thirty eight percent retracement on the on the recent fib sequence, which would be approximately four thirty. Uh, the channel, uh, as you play this thing out, would be around the four forty mark, maybe a little bit higher, maybe the four forty five mark. That would be the bottom part of the channel. Um, if it surpassed the 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 thirty eight percent retracement, the next level of support you're talking about is at uh, about four twenty to four ten, and then another very very strong support level at the three eighty mark. But I I don't think that that you would really have to have some really bad economic data coming coming in where it'll break the 400 mark um and and, and uh you know touch off of the 380 so i think what's going to happen is we're going to surpass the 460 relatively soon here maybe even at the end of this week or mid next week um and 
this thing's going to be bouncing around. And it, as long as it stays in the channel, there's a good chance that we test the 480 mark. I think once we hit the 480 mark, though, it'll probably bounce bounce off and do a, a double top. It'll, it, it'll test it. Um, it'll touch it'll touch the, the, the 480 mark and then come back down and probably, uh, you know, go to about a 450, 460, and then and test it again. And chances are, if the economic data is decent, it doesn't have to be great, but decent probably will suppress the 480 mark next year. So that's my take on it. I'll do a more high res picture of these fib sequences so you know what I'm talking about, so you can see the overlap. But this has played out exactly what I've been saying in terms of support levels. That the, this overlap between the uh, the the start of the of this new bear market that started all the way into last year, um, uh, overlaps with the fib sequence that started with the crash in twenty twenty and the overlap with the crash in twenty sixteen. So let me um, let me take down that chart, and I want to hear this this uh, Exxon Mobil CEO. What, what's he? What, oil has been trading down lately. It's good to see you, David. It's good to see you too, Darren Woods, uh, uh, the CEO of Exxon Mobil. Jim, I want to throw it back over to you. Just get your thoughts here. We also got some news this morning from Chevron as well in terms of their some of their spending plans. I thought it was amazing. I mean, here is the CEO of the most storied oil company in the world talking about balance, not talking about, listen, we gotta, we gotta do a lot, we gotta bring, bring out as much oil as we can. No, he's talking about bringing out a lot of oil and then balancing it against emissions. I, I don't know if people in government realize how radical this is. He, he is a radical when it comes to oil executives. Now, David, how, how much change has this man experienced in the time that he's been at Exxon? Enormous amounts of change. Uh, and really, even over just the last three years, frankly. You know, and, and, and so much of the time I spent with him a year and a half ago, two years when we were doing our documentary, was really questioning the the ambitions when it came to carbon capture. But I have to say, since then, they bought Denver in the pipeline system. They've gotten the permits to, to a certain extent to, to, to store the carbon if they, if, when and, if and when. And they signed deals, Jim. So you know, they really done it uh, to a certain extent. Obviously, so much more to do. It's just incredible. I mean, I, I, I know from our Chapel Trust, we have a position in Lindy. The biggest the biggest carbon capture uh, development in our history is being made by Exxon. And they don't even want to brag about it. That's not their stop. What they're doing is saying, listen, we're putting the money right there. You want to make a decision about whether we're good actors or not, go ahead. But I, I'm making that decision right here. After that interview in Newark, I've done with Exxon and Lindy. I, you can't help but be impressed. They are the leader of this game. They're the leader in trying to save the environment while they get out of the get the most oil on the ground. It's right. It's not an either or, as Darren Wood says. It's an and. Uh, and it is certainly of incredible importance. Jim, we're going to get an opening bell right here in two, one. Still, just the set up will be on. So for the ones that don't know, when, when you watch the business channels, they have a time delay. And because I have a direct feed, you know, for trading, um, you know, everything's in real time for, for the, so you heard my bell happen first before their bell because they're on a time delay. But um, oil is trading at about just above $70 a barrel. Now, if Chevron and other, you know, an ExxonMobil start to pump more, more oil and natural gas, that's really going to suppress the natural gas and the WTI price. So that's good for consumers. Um, I think, you know, here's my take on it because, you know, I know a little bit about oil. Um, 
my take is is that I think that the oil executives are already planning in that Trump's going to win and the Democratic Party is going to lose the White House. So they are set, setting in motion to be able to benefit from oil and gas exploration and, and production. So that's going to suppress the price. So that's good for consumers and it'll help with inflation. All right. Now, as a trader, that would mean that you have to put a short position in oil uh, and, you know, and, and ease up on your uh, tight, ease up on your long positions in oil. And there are different ETFs to do that, you know, either leveraged or unleveraged ETFs. But uh, I do think that long term, uh, there is a strategy the next 12 months to 24 months that there's going to be a downward pressure on oil. Now, there's two reasons for this. One, the inflationary problem that we have in the United States, we need to bring down oil price. And that's as easy as just pumping more oil. We have more oil and gas than Saudi Arabia does, if we want to use it. Um, now, there's also the issue with bad actors in the Middle East and, and Russia, where they're funding their, their war effort, or their, you know, Iran's funding their terrorism effort by selling oil on, on the market. Well, if you can suppress oil prices, then you're cutting off some of their their funds for their war effort. So I think there's also this strategic geopolitical thing that's going on that uh, will align well with, I think, Trump. Um, it's harder for the Democratic Party to align with this, even though they may want oil prices to go down to reduce funds that are flowing into Iran, their, their constituency, their, the people that vote for them are so hell-bent on destroying the fossil fuel market that, you know, they'll cut their nose despite their face. So um, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for the White House and, and the Senate that's controlled by the Democrats to pivot. Uh, it's going to be a lot easier for a Republican president to, to, to pivot on, on the strategy. So I think that the oil executives are smart in prepping for that big, the, the big payout when Trump comes back into, into, into office. I think, um, I think the Democrats are really worried that Trump is gonna win. And it just, you pay attention, you know, you can kind of send, you don't even have to even pay attention to even the debates. You just have to pay attention to where the money's falling. And you, you're, you know, they, they're, you know, they are decision makers. And it's like, where, you know, where is this all moving to us? So it does seem that the oil is going to be suppressed. So if people that are paying attention, uh, at least on what I'm saying with the oil, um, you're going to start seeing that oil prices are going to be going downward. Now, where's the bottom? I don't know. Oil is a very, very volatile market, and that's why it's so great to play it. But you got to have a stomach for it because it's, it can turn on you really quickly. So, um, you know, you have to have different hedging strategies. So it's not for the faint-hearted. The ones that are just not very experienced in trading, just pay attention to what I'm saying with the S&P 500 and the support levels and the resistant levels. There's a resistant level at the 480 mark. There's a support level at, you know, at these at different um, intersections of these FIB sequences that I was saying. Um, but I do think that there's this, this, the market's going to march up, at least for the short term, uh, throughout this month. Barring some crazy thing that happens, like a nuclear explosion or something. But, you know, I just, I just, I, I think that we're, we're going to be trading above the 460 mark and marching towards the 480 mark. And test it. I don't think we'll pass the 480 mark for the first buy. But oil, that's a, that's a different ballgame. There's there's a geopolitical play that's going on, and there is a change, there's a potential change in policy if Trump gets back into office. That's going to be a suppressed price in oil. And that means it's that 
means cheaper gas, and that also means uh, you know more money in your pocket for the American consumer. That's a big. That's a that's a a big a, a big help out there. Um, but oil's trading at around seventy dollars a barrel right now. A little bit above. It's around 70, 20, 70, 30. Um, that's WTI. Then there's the international market, which is Brent, which usually trades a little bit higher. But uh, that's my take on it. I want to. There's. Uh, I want to jump back into Bloomberg. They're talking about some shares with Alphabet. Like until next year through Bard. That's the one that is, according to Google, more powerful than ChatGPT4. It's natively multimodal, meaning it was pre trained to take inputs that are both text and images and do stuff with them. The goal here for the company is the AI that feels more like a helpful collaborator and less like a smart piece of software. Again, we didn't see a big movement in the shares yesterday. Then JP Morgan says perhaps this is because some analysts viewing this product is not quite complete and the fact that Ultra has to come out next year. But uh, BI is Mandeep Singh pointing to the potential distribution advantage for Alphabet versus OpenAI. So maybe markets just slower to process this news, and that's what investors are computing this morning, John? It's only spent this morning, so my thank you just a lift across the board here. The stock is up by more than 5%, the broader market up by 0.5%, the Nasdaq up by 09 Here's the outlook. This was the conversation I've looked forward to all morning. So far, Liz Young, weighing in on the state of markets and writing the following. Markets are wrapped up in contradictions, at least for the rest of the year, and the glass half full side is still winning. Liz, I'm pleased to say, join us right now. Liz, I've been talking about, you know, a little bit earlier this morning, a market of massive contradictions. Can we just pick out a few of them? Well, you've already covered a couple of them. Think about the oil market. We've got oil prices falling at a time when cyclical stocks have rallied and started to really catch up to those top big tech names. So the market, the stock market seems to think that cyclicality is still alive and well. The oil market is a little confused about that. And we're having a debate over whether it's supply or demand driven. And then you've got things like just markets versus the economy in general. Obviously, we've seen a really strong rally in markets this year at a time when we've intentionally cooled the economy. Now, things have held up better than I think many expected, but we were welcoming and are still welcoming some cooling in the data. So there's a little bit wrapped up in that. Uh, and then if you look at things like just holiday spending, so some of the topics of the moment, we had retailers come out with Q3 earnings and a lot of their outlook saying that they were worried about demand softening. They hadn't built up quite as much inventory and they'd really cautioned about results being lackluster. And now we've got holiday results that are saying consumers were spending before, they're still spending now and things are doing okay. Liz, let's go through that. Three points there, the broader market, the relationship, the economy, then we've got crude and what's happening to the consumer. I want to talk about the consumer. What's important to you? How much they're spending or how they're spending? Does buy now, pay later mean we should be concerned? My personal opinion is yes, it does mean that we should be concerned. Now, there are all different types of deals out there in buy now, pay later. You can do it at 0% financing or you can do it at 18% financing. I would argue, though, if people are only doing BNPL for a couple months, what would really be the point? Unless they're taking that money and investing it into something that's going to earn them more over that couple month period and, and engaging in some kind of interest rate arbitrage, which is not what I think is happening, then I do think the BNPL, the growth of BNPL, particularly this holiday season, on the heels of so much growth in credit card debt, auto loan delinquencies in the subprime sector, it's just all adding up to tell me that consumers are starting to overspend, if not already overspending. So that may not come home to roost this year, but in January and February, when some of those bills come due, we need to be careful and watch what's happening with delinquency rates and watch what's happening with consumer spending early in 2024. So Liz, let's fold in crude. Right now, $70 yesterday in the 60s. You mentioned it. How do you frame the move in crude. Is that something that's going to help consumers or a sign that maybe some pain is just around a corner? Well, it's clearly going to help consumers at the gas pump. I mean, gas prices have come down quite a bit. That's definitely freeing up some more disposable income for consumers. They've been under pressure because of that all year. And, and that's really been some of the big story about inflation is that the non-negotiable items like food, shelter, gas to get to work 
are what have really been crimping the consumer spending pattern. So that's certainly a tailwind for consumer spending in the short term. If you zoom out and look at crude prices, now obviously there are arguments to be made for this is supply driven. I do think over the long term, crude prices will be supply driven, but over the near term, that really big drop in crude after we got an announcement of, of further production cuts didn't make a ton of sense for the supply story. So it tells me that the market is looking ahead and saying, we're worried about demand. It could be a lot of out of Asia. It could be worries about China demand and just not this resurgence in demand that we were expecting. But that doesn't bode well for the global economy in general if we're worried about demand continuing to soften. I do think that crude prices will recover and I think that we will settle out above where that big drop actually happened. But it did send a signal that there were concerns over cyclicality. So this has been a big topic of conversation for us this morning, as I'm sure you know, Liz. So I'd love your thoughts. Just a bit of bow on it. You see the move lower in crude paired with the move lower in yields not as ingredients for a reacceleration of this economy, but a reflection that maybe something worse is just around the corner. Is that right? I think it's just the consternation in investors that something worse could be around the corner. We've been hearing ad nauseum that demand is going to soften. We needed demand to soften in order to take care of the inflation problem, the global inflation problem. So now it's happening and there's this nervousness about, okay, we wanted it to cool, but is it cooling too fast? We want to make sure it doesn't cool too fast and go too far. So we're at this point where we're trying to figure out if cooling is going to tip over into contraction. And I think investors are just trying to make sure that they're positioned for either direction. It feels like a coin toss and it may continue feeling like that through the end of the year. So what would you be advocating for in the stock market, Liz, right now? You know, what's interesting in the stock market is that there's a lot of rotation going on under the surface, but it doesn't seem like there's a ton of new money coming in. It's the rotation out of this year's big winners into this year's big laggards. And I think that that makes a decent amount of sense right now if you're worried about missing out on any further rally. I'm pausing her and then I'm gonna interject. Like I said, the move has been really aggressive in the S&P 500, all right? If it was just cyclical, it would have been trading flat. That's telling me that there is positioning that's taking place that is going to the, the betting that it, the S&P 500 is going to trade higher than the 4,600 mark and that this is most likely going to test the 4,800 mark. I don't think it, this year it will surpass the 4,800 mark. Now, barring some crazy thing that happens, like, you know, additional conflict in the Middle East, U.S. fighter jets, you know, doing air support for Israel or something like that, or some move in Taiwan by by uh, uh, China or, you know, a tactical nuke going off in Europe, uh, I think that the market's going up and that there's more to this than just cyclical. Because if it was just cyclical, then you most likely would see a flat trading market. You wouldn't have this such a, an aggressive move upward once it bounced off of that 23% retracement line from 2016. So I think she's wrong. I think she's flat out fucking wrong. When you look into 2024, the question will be answered of whether or not this rally is lasting by people taking money out of money markets, out of treasuries and putting it into risk assets. Personally, I don't think that that's going to happen in a huge wave. I think there's going to continue to be consternation. There's going to continue to be worry about whether or not things will slow too much. So where would you position in the stock market? Number one, if you're looking for growth that isn't as interest rate sensitive, healthcare is a good option for that. And number two, I think you do have to be positioned somewhat in the consumer, but I would go on the consumer staples side, just judging by what's happening in discretionary and the volatility of discretionary spending, especially on the heels of all of this credit buildup. And then you can still be in things like utilities, be in some of those defensive sectors instead of just trying to chase the FOMO trade in tech. So utilities, top of the power yesterday, leading the way. Liz, thank you for the update on the big contradictions. I think she's a little, I think she's, she's, I think she's a little too um, cautious. Now, a lot of people have been saying that there was going to be a big fall in the market this year, going all the way back from March, right, because of what was going on with uh, 
these banks that were starting to fail in, in California. Um, even I was, you know, thinking that there was, you know, going to be a, a more serious downturn. So this half glass full um, perspective won out compared to the half glass empty perspective. Um, my take on it is this is all about the economic data that come, that flows in uh, from the holiday season. Now, there's going to be probably a little bit of less economic activity because it's all happening in December. So there'll be less economic activity in January of next year. Uh, so there may be some repositioning and a little bit of sideways trading or maybe bounce off of the 480 mark for the S&P 500 you know, for SPY and, and go down a little bit, but it's going to retest. I think that we're seeing another bull, bull, bull market here that's starting to arise. And it's always the worry. When people are worried, that's a good sign. That's a good sign for markets, you know, in terms of position. It's when people are exuberant and think that it's just going to keep on climbing and climbing and climbing. That's when you start worrying. So, um, so it's kind of counterintuitive. But, I, you know, there's, there's a few things that are going on. You have geopolitical risk. You have the consumer risk in the United States that's still iffy. And you have this, this, um, this new dynamic that's starting to take hold with the oil market and how that may affect inflation. Um, it may actually help inflation go down if, if the oil prices keep on going down. Now, she thought, she thought that this oil price will start to elevate again back to you know, the high 70s or maybe the low 80s is the interpretation I thought she was saying. Uh, I personally think that um, we're we're looking at low 70s or high 80s in the short term and in the long term. If the Republican Party gains more seats in the House and wins the White House in the next election, and the the polls start to show that that there's going to be a, a switch of guard in the American po politic. Um, you're probably going to see a even more suppressed oil price because there, these these oil companies are going to pump more oil because the restrictions from the Democrat Party won't be there, and there'll probably be even discussions about the Keystone Pipeline again. So if that's the case, then you're talking about below sixty dollars a barrel. Um, you know, probably in the high fifties. But again, you know, oil is a very volatile thing. And, there's ups and downs, you know, they, there, there can be a, a spike in oil for whatever reason, geopolitical or, you know, demand driven or supply driven, as she was saying, and then it'll come back down. So it's a, it's a volatile, it's like riding a Bronco or, you know, riding a wild horse. It's, it's not, it doesn't happen in a straight line, but you can, you know, do averages, you know, and I, I think it's, I think there's more probability of a suppressed oil market than in terms of price compared to an elevated one as we're marching towards the general election in the United States. That's so fine. Your market at the moment about 14 minutes into the session, advancing by, let's call it half of 1% on the S&P, doing nicely on the NASDAQ. Coming up on this program, Elon Musk's rocket company could be worth $175 billion. Uh, they say, what, what, what's the fastest way to make a uh, small fortune in the rocket industry? The, the punchline is you start with a large one. SpaceX discussing a potential tender value in the company of 170. Port Miami is the world's largest cruise port, and currently we're the 10th largest container port in the United States. By 2030, <laughs> So right now the Dow is trading about four points up. This S and P five hundred is trading at seventeen points up. S and P five hundred is trading better than the Dow right now, um, and it's trading about four thousand five hundred and sixty-seven or so. So that's the that's the market update. Um, I'll probably do another video that gives you a high res picture of all these fib sequences overlapping. 
But um, thank you for listening. I'm going to do a little bit of a product plug for the store. So please go to the go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nano silver soaps that I have. I have different varieties. This one happens to be lemongrass, but uh, I have five different varieties. I also have peppermint and charcoal tea tree and a couple others. But please go to the store and get the structural nano silver soaps. They're, they're, they're great ideas for holidays, you know, holiday gifts, but you know, it's a higher end soap, neutralizes pathogens because of the structural nano silver. Very high quality. I have also this silver gel in a tube, and this will help to neutralize pathogens. You know, we're in the cold season in the United States, so it's really important to neutralize pathogens, especially with some of the things that are starting to pop up. So what you do is you just put this on your hands, it stays active for five hours. You can put it around your mouth, around your nose, lightly coat your nostrils, put it around your ears, lightly coat your ear canal and around your eyes, and it'll help to neutralize pathogens. That product happens to be 24 PPMs. I also have another silver gel that is 35 PPMs, which is parts per million. This one is in a dispenser, so it's easy to carry in your in your bag. Um, so if you'd like to, you know, get this one, you know, because of ease of, of travel and it has a higher PPM, it's a it's a great product also. Uh, you apply it the exact same way. It's there's no difference in the application. I have a product that's in a powder that helps to boost up your immune system. It's lignans. It's a flax pulp powder. Um, now, take this every day. You can mix it in a smoothie or put it, I put it in hummus. I have hummus every day for lunch. You can put it with water, mix it with just your food. But uh, the idea is to take this every day. It'll help to boost up your immune system. It'll actually help with hormonal health for males and females. Magnesium and zinc, really important to take every day, especially during the cold season. You want to take a double dose if you're not feeling well. Though it's these minerals are really important to to help to boost up your immune system. I have a very easy to digest multivitamin, high quality. All my products are very high quality, even though they're a little bit more expensive, but they're extremely high quality. And um, the, the, this multivitamin, right? If you take this every day, you will have the right composition of minerals and vitamins to be able to have proper enzymatic activity. Minerals and vitamins are cofactors for many, many different enzymes. If you don't have the proper level, then your enzymatic activity will be subpar. I've partnered up with Rain Rainbow Herbals and we've created these deodorant bars that actually detoxify your body, all right? We have it in citrus or in peppermint tea tree lavender, all right? And these are made from essential oils from the Himalayas, extremely high quality ingredients. You can't get a better high quality deodorant bar than this. It'll also help to detoxify your body because of the ingredients that we put in this. So there's a dual purpose. You use this every day and it'll help to detoxify your body and get your body healthy. My take on this is, is that if you detoxify your body regularly, you do proper supplementation, proper diet and exercise, then what will happen is, is that your immune system will become better and then you will age slower. You're, you're the, 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 um, especially when you're taking high doses of high doses of antioxidants. Again, we're in the cold season. So also go to the store, the studio .com. Link is in the description of this video and all my videos, but please go to the store and get the lozenges. I have a 20 count lozenge lozenges that are in sweet menthol, all structural nano silver. Again, the structural nano silver will neutralize pathogens. And that's exactly what you need during the cold season. I also have it in green apple. All right, 20 cups. But I also have drops 
And these drops are smaller than the lozenges in a hundred count. I have it in blueberry, hundred count, and also honey and lemon, hundred count. So get a couple bags of these. Make sure that your household is stocked up with the, the products that I have on the store. That's only a very small subset of the products that I have. I have C60, which is a very strong antioxidant to neutralize free radicals that helps to slow down the aging process and then boost up your ATP because it, it improves the mitochondrial health of your cell. I have liquids and gels for structural nano silver. I take a teaspoon of liquid structural nano silver every day. I swish it in my mouth, gargle it, and then swallow it. And uh, I also have a structural nano silver toothpaste that is the best toothpaste that you can get. So please go to the store. That's only just a small fraction of the, the products that I have on my store to help boost up your immune system. But the core of the anti-aging protocol is liquids and gels for structural nano silver. Take them every day. Take C60, either in avocado or coconut oil. Take a teaspoon of it every day and take turmeric and ashwagandha supplements to bring down inflammation. And when you do that, when you use those every day over a period of time, there's going to be compound effects that you'll start to notice that your immune system is better and that you are aging slower. Now you can add stuff to that, like the B-complex, the, the multivitamins, the zinc, the vitamin C, the collagen, you know, you can add stuff to, to that, but that, but that's the core. So please go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Also make sure that you subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube. I have BitChute, Rumble, and Brighton. Some of the things that I say on YouTube cannot stay up on YouTube because I, you know, it's very sensitive information that they put strikes on my channels. <laughs> So it's important that you subscribe to all my channels. I would really appreciate your help by you subscribing to all of them, but also asking your social network to subscribe to my channels. I have been censored on YouTube heavily for four years for the stuff that I have covered to try to help people manage through the crisis. So I need your help to, to you know, fight that censorship. So please ask your social net, network to subscribe. Uh, to help support my news coverage, uh, you can donate on my store, purchase the products on my store. I have, you can donate through Striper PayPal on the homepage of my website, the studio reykjavikcom You can also donate through Buy Me A Coffee or uh, be a paid subscriber to my Patreon channel. By doing that, uh, it helps support my work. All my news coverage is free. I don't put anything behind a paywall. So uh, support is greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.